Klang join us today for the last of six lectures uh, on design and the biodiverse. And we have really moved across scale. And when we started with Richard Weller, we were at the global scale, talking about the biosphere being the kind of garden wall, if you will. And you know, so happy to have the last speaker be an architect and be making things that deal with multi, multiple species and our relationship to them. So Joyce is an associate professor and associate chair and director of undergraduate and graduate studies. Wait a minute, you're everything. You're <laughs> there, my goodness. In the Department of Architecture uh, at the University of Buffalo School of Architecture and Planning. And through her, and we'll see this today, through her teaching research and critical practice as director of Ants of the Prairie, she confronts contemporary ecological conditions through creative means. So Joyce, uh, thank you for joining us and, and, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Julia, for inviting me here and really nice to, to see all of you. Um, really glad to share my work. Um, just, I, I actually am currently um, only director of graduate studies. So, okay. so I do have a little bit of, uh, you know, reprieve from some admin duties at this particular moment. Good. <laughs> yeah, thankfully. Um, so yes. So yeah, I let me share my screen just a second. Okay, so the title of the talk is our, um, Architecture for the Collective. And I'm not sure if, if there was anybody in this group that was um, part of Angela Coe's class in New York, but I gave a very similar talk um, in, in her class in looking at, um, I think it was Wild New York. Um, but in any event, so hopefully this won't be a repeat for anybody, but, um, but uh, just apologies if it is. Um, so the title of the talk, I'll, I'll sort of unpack a tiny bit to start. I'll zoom out a bit and reflect on who our audiences are in architecture. Of course, we know in conventional practice, we understand the importance of the role of the client um, as our kind of primary or what we think of as our primary audience and stakeholder. And beyond that, we understand the idea of the user, right? Um, so those that use our structures and our buildings. But beyond that, I think there's a third category that emerges that we might describe as a, a form of new public. So these are um, stakeholders that are affected by architecture and its consequences, but don't necessarily always have um, voice in its processes. And so this inclusion of this third category is, um, for me, is the notion of the collective. Um, you know, who, who are we really designing for outside of who we typically think um, are our typical clients and stakeholders? And so along those lines, one of the questions I've been grappling with over this last decade or so is thinking specifically about the conflicted perception that we as humans have toward uh, non-human species. When we think of the built environment, um, cities in particular, we don't think of this as animal territory, right? We, um, even though of course they're an important part of our ecosystem, we we see this as you know as our territory, and we and that we're building what here. Well, while in fact we're actually taking over land that has already been. Um, that has plenty of habitat on it, even if it seems like it's barren in some cases. Um, we like the idea of, you know, seeing birdhouses in parks or in um, our backyards, but in, um, but when we think about buildings, um, the, the notion of sharing structures with animals is not commonly accepted. And we see a lot of these kind of exclusionary um, artifacts on, on buildings that try to, um, you know, try to get rid of animals, right? And for the most part in the United States, at least, a lot of our urban fauna is actually categorized as a nuisance animal. So in New York State, there's actually laws about which animal that you can you can kill at any time um, if they're if they're deemed to be a nuisance or damaging property. And so I've just sort of highlighted a few. This is actually an old list. I was looking at a new one more recently, which is slightly different, but this is one from a few years ago. Um, so we place a lot of regulations on the environment um, and on and our buildings and landscapes are, uh, you know, um, respond to that. But, but on the other hand, um, when they're left unmaintained, they're always appropriated in totally different and unexpected ways. And this is something I've really been kind of discovering a lot in, in Buffalo, where I'm currently um, speaking with you from, 
um, a lot of the kind of uh, vacant properties and um, vacant landscapes, they're often, um, you might see them as kind of like unmaintained, but after, but oftentimes they're actually teeming with different forms of life. And so this is just one example of a house in Buffalo. Um, this is a structure that, um, a crumbling wall that I actually um, was um, a, um, exploring a bit with this biologist here in this photo. And um, she's basically pointing out how spaces like these little crevices are actually really great for, for, um, for animals, for urban wildlife and different species. And so the fact that we as humans are not alone on the planet or in our cities is something that I need that I think needs to have a much broader cultural resonance. So obviously biodiversity loss, um, a big focus of, of yours here is, is um, a, an urban global global issue. But and I think um, but you know it's probably something that's not on the forefront of many people's consciousness, especially when they're thinking about architectural, like 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 straight up architectural design. Um, and I think a big hurdle in in um, achieving this is the kind of conflicts that we that we as humans have uh, toward animals in cities. And so um, while we might see birds as desirable creatures um, that I mentioned before, when we see birds in this kind of context, what happens here, right? Um, they're encroaching, they're hands encroaching on our space in unwanted ways. And um, so I think also there's a kind of perception, um, and this is another photo from Buffalo, where um, the idea of nature taking over in cities, um, especially when their presence oftentimes in underserved neighborhoods is associated with lack of care. This is something that I think is also a kind of um, a kind of a, an issue that that emerges when we're talking about um, nature and wildlife in in cities. So um, many years ago, I was thinking about different ways to reconsider the ideas about building typologies and uh, adaptive reuse specifically in some speculative projects. So this is actually a series of um, study models that looked at different ways that a building facade might be manipulated um, and designed, uh, adapted to allow for more animal habitation. This was um, looking at bat occupation. This is a series of projects called um, Pest Wall. And uh, here's another kind of version of that. Um, simultaneously though, I was also, uh, I was also start, starting to kind of develop some small scale um, interventions. And um, so this is a project called Bat Tower. This is the first um, installation that I, that I designed and built um, to draw awareness to non-human species um, and promote their importance as part of our ecosystem. Um, and so here's uh, some closer up um, views of Bat Tower. This is from 2010. And the, the idea of this project is that it takes cues from the kinds of spaces that we typically see bats, um, at least North American micro bats occupying, um, which are oftentimes these kind of small, thin crevice-like spaces. Um, oftentimes they will come into your attic through little, um, through little uh, like ventilation holes. As you can see there, they, they kind of um, roost between, between structure coming in through um, louvers and so on. And so the, the idea of this project was to basically take um, this idea of the thin slotted uh, thin, thin slotted spaces and kind of move that into the tectonic language of the project. So here's looking at the exterior of the tower, and this is the inside of that tower um, looking, looking down. And here's a couple of photos looking up, and what you can see here is um, basically it's like a thermal imaging camera view on the, on the right side. Um, and you can see as you look up toward the bat habitation area how it's kind of much warmer in the top. And that is largely due to the fact that the wood on the upper area of the bat tower is actually darker in tone. So it's, it's there actually absorbs more sunlight at the, at the top. And um, so of course the overall idea of this project was, um, was not just about bats, but it was about the overall ecosystem. So, you know, not, so of course bats eating insects um, and so on. And so one of the um, ideas of the project as well was to develop this planter at the base that we use to kind of plant vegetation that we were hoping would attract the insects that, the, that would hopefully attract the bats. Um, and here's just some photos of the project um, as we were constructing it in, in Griffith Sculpture Park. Um, one of the kind of um, great things about the process is that I actually learned how to operate a rough turn forklift. So here's some evidence of that. <laughs> um, and here's the project when, when, uh, when we finished constructing it. Now, um, a project that kind of um, uh, that's developed along similar lines, it's a another prototype project called Habitat Wall. 
And this is um, this is a view of Habitat Wall actually in its kind of second design iteration. I originally designed this to be installed in the exterior of a of a shed um, outside, but then um, but then uh, a number of things happened, and I ended up being commissioned to to design this for an uh, for an exhibition at SAIC in Chicago called Outside Design. So here's the project um, as it was installed there. And the idea of the project is basically that um, it's a series of uh, you know, similar bat house um, configurations also here now with bird nesting boxes and um, uh, which you can see up there. This is the kind of view of the, some of the study models of this. Um, so this is one particular bay where you can see the bat house is kind of like wedged between the structure. Um, another idea that we we're working with here was to use some salvaged wood and other recycled material, including some old window shutters. So, um, and so you can see some of those there in the construction and more construction photos. And um, one thing that was that we thought was interesting about this project is that during the opening exhibition at, at SEIC, um, there was a, um, a visitor, a guest who basically just kind of laid down on the floor and looked up into the into the project. And that was some a moment of kind of interest because um, in a way she was sort of imagining us if she were bats sort of flying under looking up into the space that she'd about to that she'd be about to enter. So I found that pretty, pretty exciting. Um, and this is this is a photo taken by um, a visitor at SAIC. So, um, so those are sort of two projects that that work with this kind of similar idea of um, th these kind of thin slotted spaces for bats, but also kind of introducing then birds. Um, this is another strategy, another small installation that kind of works with bats as well. This is a project called Bat Cloud, and here for this project, I was interested in developing a kind of um, an artifice that you might stumble upon while walking around in a location where you might not necessarily expect it. The idea of this is that it would be perceived as a kind of large mass um, uh, kind of floating in the air, but as you kind of get closer up to it, you would see that as a series of hanging pods, uh, you know, hanging, um, hanging vessels. And this is kind of what these, what these are. So it's, um, it's each of each of these vessels basically has uh, if I can, if you can see my my cursor here, but this little shaded red area is basically like um, the kind of bat habitat area. So the, uh, kind of resembling those kind of slotted spaces that I mentioned in, in the other two projects and the the kind of bulb vessel area below is a kind of planter. And so um, I mean, this didn't quite work out exactly how we wanted, but one of our ideas for this project at the time was that um, if bats were to occupy the top part, that somehow the guano would drip down and sort of, and the baskets would sort of collect guano and perhaps become fertilizer or something like that. Um, so that was a kind of like hopeful, hopeful idea in this project. Didn't quite work out, but de definitely an idea that I continue to work with in thinking about other things. Um, but the idea of it would be, you know, that it would, that to, to develop a project where the guano itself wouldn't become a nuisance and it could become something helpful and it could become collected and perhaps even part of, of a self-sustaining ecosystem. And um, the project itself is built in a place called Tiff Nature Preserve, which is actually um, a nature preserve that was built on a landfill that was um, closed in, uh, used as a landfill for Buffalo up until 1970s. And then when it was closed, it kind of turned into a nature preserve. Um, slowly over time and then officially. But one of the conditions of the, the fact that it's a nature preserve is that we couldn't dig into the ground to actually create a massive foundation. So we ended up using the trees that were already there as kind of stabilizing points for the for the back cloud. So here you can see a plan drawing of um, looking at the looking at the cloud. And here's some photos of um, the construction process uh, in, um, in very humble construction process in, in our studios and shops. And um, and here's the installation process at TIFT, which actually just took a couple of days. And finally, um, here's a kind of hopeful theme um, with once we completed the project. And so um, in a sense, I think um, one of the things that I've been trying to do with, um, actually, let me back up for a second and take a look at this. But one of the things that I've been really interested in doing, in, especially with a project, a very small, um, economical project like Backcloud, one of the things I've been really interested in, in doing is really thinking about the kind of impact of such small projects, um, especially in combating things like, you know, negative 
negative um, attitude toward bats, which we can see in things like, you know, things like this. Um, when I finished bat cloud, a uh, number, uh, because of perhaps it's, it's like, you know, it's impact um, or this kind of perceptual, this, this kind of uh, this kind of sudden surprise that uh, that occurred or that kind of took shape in TIFT, um, I suddenly started receiving a lot of emails from people in Buffalo, like um, saying, asking things like, could I help them get a bat out of their house? Or could I sell them one of the, these pods? Or could I, um, could I help Boy Scouts develop their bat house projects for Eagle Scouts? And so when, um, when I was thinking about, you know, how uh, such a small project could kind of pose a number of questions, I started thinking, well, yes, maybe this is the kind of, these little projects are, are, are the kinds of things that can start combating um, this type of negative attitude that one might have toward animals. And which I thought was particularly important, especially given um, uh, the kind of the critical urgency of white nose syndrome, which as many of you might know, is a disease that's been killing off bats in great numbers um, across the northeastern part of the United States. Uh, and it was it was kind of inexplicable at one moment, but now they their scientists understand how it's happening, but still something that is that is causing a lot of deaths and bat it's and despite the fact that it's a kind of it, that is an urgent um, ecological issue, it's something that just doesn't really kind of surface as a as a as a condition to deal with. So um, and I think another aspect that was quite interesting about developing small projects is that I think it piqued also the curiosity of people like scientists and biologists who, um, you know, some of them start working with me already, but I think other biologists were became interested in, you know, how they could start to become involved in art projects. These are a couple of the biologists that were working with me at that time. Um, likewise, we started also thinking about small projects as potential, um, you know, science experiments too. Like, could there be a way that you could take a project and sort of do use the, it as a kind of instrument or device for research um, in some way where you could start to kind of um, understand um, conditions of the built environment a little a little better, um, you know, given the given the tendencies and the preferences of of animals. Um, another kind of thing that I started thinking about through these small projects was um, how you could, we could start to think about architecture as a form of activism. And this, at this point, I was really interested in the idea of, um, or in the kind of in, in the crisis of bird glass collision. And so many of you know, of course, that um, that one of the primary reasons why birds um, die in cities is you know crashing in glass, which they can't really see. Uh, it's you know transparent to them or it's trans transparent reflective glass, it's not visible to them. And so um, in kind of addressing bird glass collision, of course, there are a number of organizations and institutions that are already working on this as well. And, and I'm sure you're familiar with, with many of these. Um, but for um, this next project, I'll, I'll show quickly, this is called um, No Crash Zone. And in this project, I was really interested in taking on the idea of bird glass, bird glass collision in a much more visceral way. Um, so rather than, you know, kind of making the, um, you know, a frit pattern that would just, that would be as invisible as possible, I was really trying to kind of amplify um, a kind of visual interference pattern that birds could see and that humans could see that birds would be seeing it. Um, and so this is a kind of ornamental pattern that was derived um, using the kind of exterior patterning of this building in Chicago. Um, here it is looking, here we are looking straight ahead at the window with the pattern on it. Um, with the bird anti-bird strike patterning on it. And here's some drawings of it. Um, and this, the idea of this project is that it makes visible this logic of bird strike prevention, not um, and but also conflates it with a single point perspective so that you can see um, they so it kind of like so it kind of suggests this idea of like looking through a kind of in a single point perspective in a through a perspectival window. Um, uh, in, a, in, in sort of um, addressing the idea of the human desires for framed views. And here's some more photos of this project. And so thinking about similar issues, um, I developed in 2016 an installation for birds in collaboration with uh, a New York City-based artist named Ellen Driscoll. And this is a project called Bauer. It's basically a series of building-like fragments that are scattered across the landscape. And um, each of these um, each of these fragments has a series of bird nesting boxes at the top, um, which you can see here. Um, and each of the fragments also contains um, a, a kind of window-like frame that holds a piece of glass 
that is custom made with drawings by Ellen Driscoll. Um, so these are drawings that she developed of local uh, birds and local vegetation in Western New York. This is installed in Art Park in Lewiston, New York. And, um, and oops, so sorry, I was, um, before I go to the next project. So this is, this is another project that we developed um, basically incorporating anti-bird strike patterning to draw attention to this danger. So I, I've just been talking about um, a number of collaborations. I was talking about biologists and now a collaboration with an artist. I also started collaborating um, somewhat recently in 2018 and 19 with another architect named um, Nerea Feliz. Um, and we started working together on, a, on an ongoing project for Madrid, Spain. And when, when Nerea and I work together, we actually go by the name of Double Happiness. So I'll kind of talk through this, this project a little bit. Um, so in 2019, we, um, we were working as part of a curated group of designers to transform an open space in um, the former municipal slaughterhouse of Madrid, which is called Matadero, and this is what you see here. There's a lot of programming of the interior spaces and some exterior as well. This is actually a really excellent um, kind of museum gallery. And it's got a lot of a lot of amazing spaces and, and renovated areas inside. Um, but due to the summer sun in Madrid, it's not necessarily the outdoor spaces are not very desirable places to be, especially if it's very hot, very hot. There's a lot of urban heat island effect. And so there was a, um, a firm in Madrid called Ellie that was um, that was that had commissioned or had pulled together five groups of designers to basically develop a kind of um, a series of projects that would address this issue and in this kind of collective group, which they, they called um, all of the projects together, Cyborg Garden. But our project, um, I'll show you our specific project. So one of the ideas was to incorporate plants, you know, that would of course mitigate heat island um, effects, but also attract pollinators. So we started looking at the local species of pollinators, um, uh, butterflies, but also the, the um, um, also the plants that the caterpillars would, would feed on. And we were also thinking about, in general, the fascinating world of insects and how important they are in biodiversity, but how underappreciated they often are. Um, we became fascinated with the, some of the lesser known um, qualities about insects, for example, the vision of butterflies and how they see certain colors, I and mean, then UV re reflected light more prominently. And that's one of the ways that they're able to see flowers in the field. They can see certain colors, but not others. So they're able to kind of fly to the centers of flowers, and so on. And so our proposal was basically a series of urban furniture pieces that would all function in different ways. So these, this is um, uh, a series of pieces that we were calling Sapling Island, which would kind of move together to form a series of benches, but also hold, um, become a planter for, for um, young trees and other vegetation. Um, this is a, a prototype that we were calling Arthropod Cinema, um, which would be a um, creating a situation where people could kind of witness a spectacle of insects at night projected through these shadows um, or through projected shadows, as you can see with the, the lights. And of course, we understand this idea of insects like flying to kind of lit surfaces at, at night, um, which is called positive phototaxis. Um, and here's another drawing of how that would that would work. And you can see in the drawing also the kind of species that we were sort of looking at in these in these um, projects. Um, this is this is another um, idea, which is a kind of planter that would be designed to incorporate colors and um, that would mimic some of the camouflage qualities of flowers that insects are attracted to, um, to hopefully attract some butterflies. And um, and we were also interested in the idea of pro um, providing a kind of garden for caterpillar refuge. So um, we you know oftentimes we we love seeing butterflies, but it's the caterpillars that humans are have kind of a conflicted relationship with oftentimes because they do eat many of our plants. And sometimes the plants for caterpillars are actually ones that humans are not necessarily you know want to have in their garden, such as stinging nettle. So that was uh, another consideration. It's like how can you be a kind of protected area where caterpillars could potentially thrive? Um, but it wouldn't be kind of, you know, a kind of human, human centric garden. Um, and here's some drawings of that. And um, we also developed this idea for a project called the human cocoon. So this is another of these prototypes where, um, you know, taking on similar form, but it would be a place for, for humans to kind of intimately gather in, in public space. Um, they could sit in this kind of cocoon like setting um, in within a wall that would have all these um, um, at least in our in our mind, they would be sort of uh, 
um, like openings that you could look through and sort of see the world as if you were kind of seeing, see, or see the world as if you were an insect. So trying to kind of like, you know, bring in a series of filters that would allow you to kind of like look at things with different colors and so on. And um, we were actually experimenting with drawings in a way where we were drawing, doing these kind of like descriptive drawings on one side and then kind of a rendering, but then also doing a kind of, um, kind of uh, fantasy, I wouldn't say fantasy, but a, a, a kind of drawing that would imagine what an insect might see. So taking things like color and scattering it and then reducing and, and intensifying some certain colors and, and, and so on. And all of these walls would also have um, these kind of pods that would allow for, um, you know, solitary bee habitat and, and so on. Um, so there'd be like little pockets of spaces that where insects could thrive as well. And so for for this uh, for this project, which is called um, Hidden in Plain Sight, uh, we developed all these prototypes and and also developed a number of models that then were displayed in Matadero as part of a, an exhibition that was called um, um, Cyborg Garden, and it also became kind of absorbed into another larger exhibit called um, uh, Ecos Ecosystem Visionaries. Um, so this was a very kind of uh, broad, a kind of large, a large exhibition, but the Cyborg Garden part had five projects and ours was one of them. And here's, uh, that's the kind of our project. Um, another collaboration I'll move on to um, is one in which I engaged with a, a couple of different um, people as shown here. So one is Darren LaRue, who is an ecologist who works for the uh, Australian, um, Department of Parks and Conservation, and Mitchell Whitelaw, who is a data visualization designer from the Australian National University School of Art and Design. And this was a kind of interesting serendipitous um, collaboration that actually first started at an academic conference where we were all presenting papers in the same setting. And um, it turned out that there was a lot of kind of mutual interest between us and, and Mitchell, the, the fellow on the, on the right, realized that there was a lot of potential for, for us to collaborate. Um, and uh, Darren, as an ecologist, was very interested in the ecological value of very old trees. So he, he's basically advocating for saving trees. And if not saving trees, then make, repurposing trees in different ways. So not cutting it down into firewood, not making it into you know, dimensional lumber and none of that, but, but literally saving trees. And, and um, because he has a lot of data on things like you know, how the bark of the tree well, you know, how's uh, what has like this much more has so much more kind of biodiversity within it there, there's that there's many more species that can live within just the bark and on that there's so many just not just the bark itself, but all the kind of debris and everything that's falling off the tree. So he's been doing research on that. While I was in Australia on a residency, it turned out that there was a very large tree that was about to be removed from a residential neighborhood. And so um, as uh, as part of um, something that we um, actually initiated was to instead of having the tree cut down in you know tiny pieces into firewood which would have been the easy way to easier way to remove this tree um, we instead asked um, them to basically cut the tree down in as few pieces as possible and literally hoist it out of this area and the reason why this tree was being cut down by the way was because the branches were heavy and they had you know, one of them had sort of fallen and damaged property nearby. So this is apparently something that happens quite a bit in Australia. So we went through this process of trying to figure out how to take down the tree in as few pieces as possible. Um, it came down in, you know, uh, four pieces. Here it is um, being hoisted into um, a, a site called Bearer Hill, which is in the Molonglo Valley. This is a ecological offset zone next to an urban development area which um, is actually, it's, it, it's been deforested. So there's, there's, there used to be trees here, now there's no trees. And they're basically trying to kind of um, uh, regenerate this landscape with, um, with all these new plantings that you can see here, but also a lot of different kind of habitat restoration efforts. Um, so one of the things that, they, that they're interested in doing is because it takes such a long time for trees to actually grow, they have been developing ideas for um, artificial vertical habitat structures. So that was where this project came along, where which was to take the tree itself or the tree parts that had been taken down in as few pieces as possible and to reconstitute it as a kind of vertical, artificial vertical habitat structure. Um, so these are some of my renderings of this project and all the kind of little knobby things that you see there are basically offcuts from the tree that had fallen that were basically um, carved out and made into bird nesting boxes and bat 
houses with a chainsaw. So that's like that's that was the idea for that. And here's a, a view from the um, from the top, looking at what we imagine this would look like. Um, one of the fun aspects of this project, as well, is that we um, learned photogrammetry. Uh, so you know, because the fact because you're, when you're working with tree, it's like really impossible to actually understand the geometry of it, right? So um, it's not like we could sit there and kind of like model it in Rhino and have it be accurate. So um, we use photogrammetry to actually figure out how to, you know, to find the volume, the, the shape of the tree and, and happened and we were able to do it. Um, and so what, so this was actually amazing. I mean, for me, it was amazing because I'd never actually used photogrammetry in that way before, but um, we were able to get it precise enough where we could take, where we could make a model of it or where, the photo, where they made a point cloud model of the tree and we were able to use it with the structural engineer to figure out things, um, you know, like structure, uh, important things that architects need to, to need to know. And so here are some images of the of the project under construction. And um, I actually don't have a finished image of it right yet because that's around when the pandemic happened. But um, I'll get it at some point. Um, <laughs> but it, the project is done now, and there's actually a couple of camera traps happening um, or that have been installed at the tops of the trees, which is um, a kind of motion detector, a motion sensor camera that is capturing, you know, uh, animals that are coming by, mostly birds and so on and also bats. But what's been actually kind of amazing about this, um, what uh, that I've heard, what I've heard reported from um, the data visualization scientist is or, or designer is that there have been so a lot of reportings of uh, birds and other animals that have been landing on this so so much more than than have been before just because there simply weren't that many vertical structures in in that area of Australia. So, and um, we became really interested in the kind of collaborative nature of the project. So here's the kind of timeline of our collaboration. And I started to even think about, you know, how we might kind of rethink the architect's triangle, which as many of you know, from professional practice class is the kind of clean logic of services between the architect the client and the contractor. And so rethinking that set of relationships and to reveal something that's a much more messy relationship between collaborators to better describe the nature of shared authorship. So not just between individuals, but also between um, institutions and thinking about shared territories of knowledge. And so um, uh, I think I'm, I've also been kind of thinking about uh, these issues of habitat at a much larger scale. So I, I wonder, you know, in all the work that I've been doing, which are all small scale installations, what if we could think about them not as kind of like one offs or like these little moments here and there, but as a kind of series of, of interconnected interconnected um, efforts, right? And so and a research project that I, that I also worked on was to kind of reconsider the zoning code in Buffalo and to rethink its potential, um, especially in, combat in combating things like habitat fragmentation. So of course, you know, looking at zoning codes, usually equals like reading something like this. And, but um, I went through a process of analyzing the Buffalo zoning code, which is, this is the old code. Um, now we have a new code, but the, the old one had, was in effect since 1951, hasn't really been changed until, you know, 2016 or so. So this is a, a kind of now defunct code, but I think there's still a lot that we can learn from it. Um, I went through a, a process of basically categorizing all of the um, kind of uh, conditions and restrictions on this code and based on, um, and, based on things like uh, uses. And what I found, um, I'm obviously not gonna go through all this, but like what I found is that all the areas that are, that are marked in green indicate that you need to have a, um, a, a, a setback of either 50 to 100 feet between a residential and industrial property. And so what that means is that between residential and industrial, you'll have a very, very large area of land that's seen as a kind of restricted space that you can't build on. And so what happens is that you see conditions like this, right? Like where there's just like, you know, space that's, uh, you know, restricted, but it actually is sort of like not a whole lot's happening or people are dumping garbage or something like that. And so I started to look more closely at some of these um, boundary conditions between residential and industrial or manufacturing zones in Buffalo and started outlining them, you know, just looking through Google Street View and then looking here. And then sure enough, you can see the residential area on the right and the kind of industrial area on the left where there's a very large setback. So I went back to the um, zoning map and then thought, well, what if I started to connect all of these or if I started to first outline them and then connect all of them through um, with 
kind of green lines to show what the potential might be if these things became connected. So connecting them through um, um, vacant lots, through kind of other green spaces and so on. So could we not, to, could we start to think about the city as a kind of much more interconnected green um, network rather than as kind of a fragmented fra fragmented landscape. And so these are just some of the kind of speculative ideas that I came up with looking at this, um, at this zoning analysis. Another interesting thing that I learned um, from, from this uh, research is all the areas that are colored in blue um, are indicating um, uses of, of buildings that require that you either have a blank wall with no windows on it or you have a six foot high wall around your property um, because of the type of program that's there. Um, so it's a use based code. Um, and so I was thinking, well, that's what ends up resulting, what results from that are buildings like this, like where it's sort of some kind of industrial use inside and you have to have a wall with no windows. Um, and so I thought, well, rather than having this, could we not start to imagine a condition like this where, where the wall itself becomes a kind of habitable green wall? So that was another kind of thought of like how the zoning code could be mined to sort of create um, kind of suggestion for, for, um, for furthering biodiversity, or enhancing biodiversity in the urban, urban environment. The last project I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, talk about, um, and then I'll talk about it quickly and then I'll show a video, is a project that I completed recently for, um, Exhibit Columbus, which is a biannual uh, exhibition series um, in Columbus, Indiana. And this year it was curated by Mimi Zeiger Eker Hill. And, um, and the, the theme of the overall uh, exhibition was called um, New Middles. And so um, in my interpretation of this being New Middles, um, I started to consider the idea of middle species. So rather than thinking about the idea of flagship species or species that we that we as humans, um, when we think about animals, they're the animals that come to mind. They're the sort of emblematic animals, right? Um, but who are the species that are our um, neighbors or our community members that are there among us, that live, that live beside us, that are part of our environment, but we don't often talk about them or see them, right? So um, in walking around and exploring Columbus, Indiana, I actually took a bat detector with me, an ultrasonic bat detector, and I started to kind of try to understand the, um, the kind of movements and the locations of bats, um, you know, in and around the city, around these kind of iconic buildings. Like this is a building by um, Aero Saarinen, um, the, um, the North Christian Church, which is absolutely gorgeous, but, but and um, there's a, certainly a circulation pattern and a kind of geometric logic that you can see in the site planning here, but also what's the lo logic of the bats in this area? That's something I became really interested in. Here's another um, kind of documentation of a walk around the city also using my ultrasonic bat detector and getting a sense of where the bats are all around Columbus, Indiana. And also while walking around looking for other signs of, of non-human life. So there's interestingly, you know, the city is at the confluence of two rivers and at the river, there's all these turtle crossing signs. So that was something that I thought was quite interesting as well. So taking in this idea of, um, you know, the species among us, um, I, I, I started thinking about this idea of species strata. So what animals exist at different levels? What are the kind of occupational strata in thinking elevationally about where animals live? And that kind of idea of strata um, transfer to um, the thinking about this project, how it would be composed of a couple of different levels at least. So a kind of lower level that would be um, made out of stone um, that could be a kind of space for smaller terrestrial animals or amphibious animals or reptiles and a kind of upper area that would be for bats and birds. And so the project was sited in a location in Millrace Park, which is a park by Michael von Valkenberg um, with, um, with all the structures by Stanley Sadowitz. And here is um, a kind of study model of, of the project. It's basically a series of nine towers um, that are kind of arranged adjacent, um, really close to the confluence of the two rivers um, I was really interested in local materials, so um, locals using local stone, but also looking at the um, Indiana hardwood industry in um, creating the project. Uh, here's some just some photos of, of um, my assistants and I working on the model and also working as a structural engineer, um, working in the, in the shop. I'm going to kind of go through this part a little bit quickly because a lot of this is covered in the video that, I, that I'm about to show you, but installing the project in in Columbus, there was a high school team that was that was uh, helping us one day with volunteers. Um, I'll say really quickly as well that um, one of the kind of exciting things that happened is that there was while we were building the project and building um, the bases in particular, that um, a number of these like toads like literally started trying to hop into the project like while we were building it. 
And so, and we were observing these toads um, as they were approaching the project, trying to get in and kind of actually trying to figure out how to make it easier for them to get in because they were, they were actually hopping. To, it seemed like they actually were spending a lot of effort trying to get in. So we actually made it a little bit easier by changing the base slightly like during the construction process. So anyway, so that's another, another kind of fun thing that happened. Um, but maybe just to kind of, um, I'll just scroll through this because you'll see a lot of that in, in the video. These are some of the kind of finished photos, but um, we actually, um, as part of the process, like um, started working with, sorry, I'm like, we, we worked with a, um, uh, um, the department of um, uh, the Indiana, the Indiana um, uh, Department of Natural Resources um, and they loaned us some bat detectors and we've been, we actually um, gave the, or have collected a lot of bat sounds and are giving them to uh, musicians who are making them to bat music. So in this video, you'll also hear an overlay of music that takes bat sounds and turns it into music. Um, bats, as you know, you can't really hear them, they echolocate, so it's a kind of translation of bat sounds. So I'm going to just hopefully, I'm going to, uh, can you hear this? Yes. Okay, so this is what bat sound sounds like when you're actually, when you just collect it. Um, so I have a lot of this type of stuff. <laughs> so um, with that, I'm going to, I'm going to actually share a video now so you can get a better sense of this project. Hang on a second. And this will be the last thing. I just have to do the advanced share in just a second. most rewarding aspects of being part of Exhibit Columbus was bringing together our community at the UB School of Architecture and Planning to learn about the incredible legacy of architecture and landscape in Columbus. In the early phases of the project, I engaged a number of student groups to work with me in exploring and researching the city. Early participants were students from AIAS, American Institute of Architecture Students, UB NOMAS, National Organization of Minority Architecture Students, and Double ASAP, African American Students of Architecture and Planning. These students worked with me back and forth between Zoom and in-person model building to develop and visualize the first design ideas. My graduate assistant, Nicole Sarmiento, played an enormous role in really developing the design of the project throughout the spring semester. Mark Bajoric, our structural engineer and my longtime collaborator in Buffalo, was a critical part of our team as well. In tandem with the design process, I conducted a graduate studio that looked at Columbus and asked students to research the city and develop speculative proposals to amplify habitat for middle species in the region. As a compendium course, my colleague Gregory Delaney taught a seminar that explored the landscapes of Columbus through research and drawing. At the UB School of Architecture and Planning, a culture of making is emphasized in the kinds of projects that we do and also in the way that we dedicate our attention and resources. For Exhibit Columbus, I was keen to explore the culture of materials, not only in terms of their performance, but also in terms of life cycle and sourcing. So early visits to material suppliers, such as Estes in Hope, Indiana, as well as looking at the Indiana hardwood industry influenced the material ecology of the project. In terms of fabrication, I was also very interested in highlighting the community of makers in Buffalo. Our materials and methods shop is fantastic and it's one of the most used and beloved spaces on campus. It's not only an incredible resource for design studios, but also for seminars and even some large lecture courses, such as structures. 
Our shop manager, Wade Georgie, is really the secret ingredient to making design build projects happen. For our project, he not only coached us all in welding, which was pretty much new to everyone on the team, but he also fabricated critical components. And in the face of some of the supply chain issues that impacted our schedule, Wade also helped us secure a good part of the lumber that we needed to construct our project. And he even donated some decade old salvage steel from a past design build project at the school. In addition to three members of our original team, a number of additional students and alumni pitched in to help us fabricate the project throughout the summer. The installation process in Columbus was supported and really made possible by the local community. We were amazed by the level of care and attention that Vince Rubio and his team from the Department of Public Works put into all of the installations. And we are very grateful to Tim Coomer and his team from the Mill Race Parks maintenance crew for all their help. And personally, I was thrilled to learn how to operate a boom lift thanks to the staff at Ogles Rentals. Additionally, we were energized by the enthusiasm of all of the volunteers from Columbus who helped out, including the Environmental Club of Columbus North High School. But it was really our dedicated crew of three UB students, Nicole Sarmiento, Bethany Greenaway, and Shivin Doe, who were at the heart of the installation process. I can't say enough about how hard this group has worked, not only during the hot days on site, but all throughout the summer. Additionally, we are so grateful to colleagues and friends who made an effort to join us for a little time in Columbus to lend a hand. Greg Delaney, Albert Chow, Lisa Ramsberg, and John Pipkin. I think one of the most exciting things that has surfaced from this project has been the expanded network of collaborators that we've started working with. Early discussions with ecologists, and especially with Tim Shire from the Indiana Department of Natural Resources, steered the direction of the project toward an ambition to conduct research on bat populations in a more engaged and dynamic way. Through Tim, the Indiana DNR is loaning us a number of ultrasonic bat detectors and recorders, which are continuously collecting bat calls that will add to the DNR's database. Additionally, we formed an exciting new collaboration with two sound artists, Sean Cheeky and Enochio, or Zach Williams, who are taking the bat calls as source material for producing soundtracks by digitally processing and mixing the sounds, which is what we are listening to here.
Wow. Well, that's that's it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. My goodness. Um, as I knew it would be, because I know your work, it, it's beautiful, it's important, it's provocative. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing it. I, I do have a question that I think you, you began to answer, because early on in the lecture when you were doing, uh, I'll say smaller scale work, I was writing my notes like, how do you scale up? Mm -hmm. you know, how do you think of it less as an art installation, which has all sorts of value, whether it's advocacy or a kind of microclimate, you know, um, to, you know, how we start to think about building. Um, and, you know, I think the project you did in, doing in Buffalo where you're looking at zoning maps and finding these, I'll, I'll say leftover spaces or unbuildable spaces, especially adjacent to walls that are blank. I mean, that's kind of brilliant. Um, where you can start to think about making building surfaces differently uh is i think one step but clearly that's something on your mind how do you sure. scale this practice up how can it have um even more impact uh in architecture per se yeah. let's say build building practice per se yeah no that's a really good question that's something i've been thinking about a lot um yeah <laughs> yeah i mean that's <laughs> i mean i think it's it's interesting because as a as an architect when you're trained as one coming out of architecture school you are just you assume you just assume like well you know you've got to do a house you've got to you know you've got to do you know your parents house uh, or i don't know it's like if your parents have enough money for you to make a house but um but uh i don't know it, it's like so I have been thinking about, you know, like how to make a, an actual building. In fact, I actually recently bought a vacant property in Buffalo with the hope of, you know, of like, you know, if if I have time, whenever that happens, that I'll be able to, <laughs> to um, you know, to like create a place that I can kind of live in and also experiment in. And mm -hmm. we actually, there are faculty members in my department who have done stuff like this, where they buy property for $10,000 and they do stuff with it. Um, and so that's that's something I've been interested in in doing for a little while. Um, but I also think that there's a role for um, for how this type of work can start to impact uh, um, kind of research that that might be working in a broader scale as well. So mm -hmm. currently, I'm actually um, I'm involved in a project with Google X, um, and we're doing research on um, architecture and and biodiversity, basically. Um, it's not something I can talk about in finite terms quite yet, but I, I'm hoping that that type of work will also lead to kind of broader impact in, in the in the kind of building disciplines. Um, Fantastic. I mean, OK, next year you have to talk about it. Um, <laughs> you know, the other thing, and I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet after this, uh, that I think I've been thinking a lot about is, you know, what kind of, you know, what are the verbs or nouns we use to describe human, non-human relationships in design. You know, we can talk about coexistence. I can think about projects that make room for others, but there's just a kind of a coexisting. I can think of entanglements. But your back project with the music production, I kind of think about, you know, Roxy Torrens' work on co-creating. Mm -hmm. And there is mm -hmm. a kind of co-creation there of something that's between humans and non-humans that, mm -hmm couldn't have been made otherwise. And, and that's a whole new realm that's super, super interesting that is almost creating new subjectivities yeah. right, where we're finally like breaking down the barriers of otherness and them and us and subject object. And so that like blows my mind. So um, when you look at your work, can you, do you reflect on that? Like the kinds of relationships you're setting up between humans and non-humans or is it like a result of what you do? I think with this last project that um that uh you know with the bat music I I I I definitely reflect on that I mean that that the idea of co-creation and co-authorship I I'm I've been thinking a lot about the about co-authorship in so many, in many different ways I suppose and um and how to kind of co-author with animals is something I've been also kind of trying to do to some extent for some time but I I don't feel like I've actually really been able to do it except recently with this this project that involves like you know taking bat sounds and like and literally um using using it um in creating in creating music mm -hmm. um and do you know um, do you know the work of roxy thorin do you know her i have met her um yeah okay. I've, I've not not in person just on zoom like with any person yeah. else <laughs> so but, do uh, you know that yeah. article that i'm talking about that no, I, i'm going to send it to you though okay yes, please. 
Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, but with my uh, with my earlier work, I don't think I've quite achieved that. But that's just certainly like yeah. I think that article would be very would be very helpful. Other questions or comments? Ted always has something to say. So I said was um, it's great to see your work, and I, I'm familiar with some of it, but not all of it. So it was great for you to to present it um, coherently and rapidly. Um, I guess I, I've had a question about about your work and I've always had a question about how you balance oh certain kind of aesthetics interests with the, the, the kind of biological specificity of certain species and just what the process is for you going going through that. You know, ultimately, some of these are just you know, remarkable uh, things, call them things, not objects, but remarkable things. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, to the to human perception or to someone who's interested in the arts, and yet they're serving um, all kinds of species. So mm -hmm. maybe talk a little bit more about how you um, approach that, if you would. Uh, certainly. Um, well, I am a, more a, a pretty, tr I am trained as an architect in a traditional sense, let's say, like I went to Cornell for my undergraduate degree. Um, and I, you know, my, my graduate degree was, is also in, you know, MR. So I, I think I was secretly wishing I went into landscape architecture, but I somehow, for whatever reason, just, you know, stayed in architecture. But because of, um, I think, so there is a lot of, um, uh, I think a lot of the kinds of like, say, exercises that one does in architecture in, in, you know, in, formal design that that I that I iterate through similarly all, a lot. And so one of the one of the things that I think about quite a bit in terms of I'm not going to say quite aesthetics yet, but an exercise that I that I use a lot and I've brought this with into first year studio as well to like freshmen is to think about this idea called umwelt, which is um, means you know environment. Um, and it's 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 coined by a um, conservation biologist named Jakob von Uxel, who really was talking about the specific environment of an animal, meaning like, you know, if there's a deer and a tick in the forest, that the universal environment is the forest, but that the tick's specific environment is the deer. The, the tick doesn't care about the forest, the, kick, the tick just cares about the deer. And um, so I often think like, well, if one were to imagine like the bat's umvelt, what would that be? Like, what would that specific space be? And, and I'll, oftentimes I'll try to insist that students use, and I'll do this, I'll, I'll, I'll do this to myself too. I'll tell myself like use architectural language to create the umbelt for this thing. And so for, for something like bats, like I'll, I'll, I'll say, you know, after looking at, you know, where they live in the kind of crevices and in, you know, the expansion joints of a bridge, I'll ask, you know, what, what is that? You know, that's a gap. That's a, you know, that's a, that's a space, that's a space that's this wide, that's a space that's this deep. How can you take that and use it in a kind of say repetitive way or use that for, you know, use that in a system of proportion, like proportioning or use that in, in a, in some particular kind of, you know, tectonic or formal language to, to make something. So I'll usually start with that as a kind of building block, I suppose. I don't know. If, um, but then the question of aesthetics, I think, I think that's something I'm still kind of thinking about. Like I, at one point in the early, I think in the early, in the early phases of work, like with bat towers, I was kind of actually interested in making something like more stealth, like, um, like I wanted to make something that looked like a sculpture, but then it actually was a bat house, you know, <laughs> so that somebody might kind of go and say, oh, hey, here's a, here's a sculpture, but then it will be covered with bat guano or, you know, and so that there'd be this kind of strangeness of seeing like kind of life emerging from something that would be perceived as a sculpture. Um, and, um, and so there were sort of more abstract formal qualities to some of those projects. Um, and some of the later ones, like for example, in the exhibit Columbus project, I was really interested in like resonating with some of the, some of the context, some of the buildings that were around like the Sadowitz Tower, the Observation Tower in Millrace Park and creating a structure that would have, um, you know, a head and a tail or that would have a kind of directionality that would, uh, that would sort of um, almost, I guess, like uh, that would, that would almost be like a character of some kind, you know, that, that could, that had a, that in a way it's like the way that they were kind of leaning toward each other that they almost looked like they were sort of talking to each other to some extent almost like animated like animated towers to some extent um i don't know if that's enough to <laughs> it's sort of different for every project but right other co comments or questions maybe from some students i do have a question yeah hi, hi um 
Uh, uh, thank you, Professor Bong, for this amazing lecture and especially the bad music part because I'm also an architecture student as well as a music producer and that's an amazing way to bridge these two. And uh, Professor Ted actually asked exactly the question, uh, how do you balance arts and ecology as like, I mean, the work as an infrastructure prototype. I guess so building off from that question, like these, um, I guess there's a, like this range of projects you showed are more or less um, leaning towards, some are more leaning towards artwork that are, you showed in the galleries and some are really located in the um, wilderness or the context of, um, yeah, ecological environments. And I guess my question is how, uh, what roles does ecologist plays in your decision making? And how do you incorporate and have you, is there a moment that your decision as an architect turned out to be, I mean, false and being corrected or influenced by the ecologist or scientist? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, I think in the early projects, I saw the ecologists almost like consultants. Like I, I would, I would, you know, um, after developing some models and some drawings, I would kind of meet with my friend who is a biologist, a, a, a biologist in in the um, university here, you know, and a, a professor in the university who's a friend of mine. Like so, we would go and meet for coffee, and like she would look at my stuff and talk about it. So it was almost like consultant. But um, but I think after a certain point that it started shifting a little bit more. So I um, started working with them a little bit earlier on, like the um, the biologist who worked with me on Bat Cloud and Bat Tower, actually um, at some point, I think 2013 maybe or so, she, she co-taught a studio with me. So a lot of kind of ideas came about just from that. Um, and then later on um, in the, in the um, Australia project, uh, the ecologist in that project was key, was central from the very start. Like I would say like, and that's a project where I think it was really, there was really a lot of co-authorship, um, even though it's like, you know, in the way that the project is credited, it's like, I'm the architect, I'm the artist, you know, the ecologist, the ecologist, but really like, it's, like it's really very intertwined, the kind of decision-making processes. Like I would say that the whole idea of the project literally was his, his idea to begin with, because I, there's no way that I could have known that I mean, of course, I, I could have known this, but there was it wasn't in my in my mind at that time to like to like take an existing tree and use it. As, you know, so that wasn't something that I actually thought that I would do. But after, you know, but with the, with that as a kind of starting point, which was generated by his research, um, that became like a like in itself an exercise. And that was the driving one of the driving forces for that project. Um, and uh, and I think in that case, like he made probably just as many decisions as I did at the end of the day about like, you know, where things go and things like that. Like that was, um, that was a truly collaborative one. Um, and I think with uh, Exhibit Columbus, it was a little bit more, um, the, the ecologist there was involved in the beginning, but probably a little bit more hands-off in terms of the actual design of the art of the structures, but much more involved in in the kind of second, you know, in the in all the kind of music aspects, of course, because he was key in in like collecting all the sounds and and um, you know and figuring out like where the detectors would go. And he was actually critical in actually helping me locate the structures. That was the other thing. Um, so the the site planning of that project, you know, I kind of had I I had an idea of how I wanted to organize the structure, the towers, and how I wanted to, it to look relative to the observation tower, but um, but the but the ecologist was the one that at the end of the day was saying no put these put this over here this you know this tree canopy is too much over here you know like that kind of thing so well, you know you know Joyce <laughs> I could tell you went to Cornell because that organization was a a deformed nine square yes you are very correct <laughs> <laughs> I, that's very astute <laughs> I'm like I recognize that right it started with something yeah fascinating um, yeah. Yeah, I know I didn't mean to cut you off, but you were no, just but talking about that. You started off with an idea. I'm like, yeah, I know where that came from. <laughs> <laughs> well, I uh, so look forward to where you go from here. 
um, relative to this work. And, you know, my goodness, you need a book. Oh, you a book? thank you. Uh, not at this particular moment, but that's a great <laughs> idea. <laughs> <laughs> a great idea but yeah you know, i think it's really great for our students to i mean because we've had planners and ecologists and landscape architects talk but it's so great to have someone in our discipline um to be able to show this work at this scale that has materiality and tectonics and formal strategies and all the things that we talk about as architects and your work truly is transdisciplinary because you know the methods and techniques and language you use is is really moving between so many disciplines and 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 I think it makes some for some really really rich work. But um, we thank you for your time. Oh, well, thank you for the invitation. It's really nice to see you. And really absolutely. nice to meet you all. Yeah, absolutely. All right, everybody. Thank you for joining. And that's a wrap on our series. I think it was. Yay! Thank you, Christy, <laughs> for all your help. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye, Erin. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Bye.